Jesus. I remember hearing about this story in Sunday school just a couple of years ago. Miss Ann was a Sunday school teacher. You know, when you get kids in the room, you're always working to try to get them and hoping that you're, you're, you're getting through to them. And on that Easter Sunday morning, Miss Ann said to her students, she said, I want to know how many of you know what today is all about? Well, Sally raised her hand real quick. Sally always had the right answers, right? And she says, I know what it's about. It's the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead. And Miss Ann said, oh, that's so good, Sally. Now, why is he risen from the dead? And quickly, she raised her hand again. She said, because God made him alive after he died on the cross. And Miss Ann said, oh, that's so good, Sally. I'm so proud of you. Now, now why did Jesus die on the cross for us? And Sally once again raised her hand. She said, because we're sinners and we needed a Savior. Miss Ann was so proud of her teaching. Well, there's another kid in the class named Johnny. Now, Johnny is one of those kids that was always a little bit frustration. Basically, he was a high-energy kid, but he made up with it with a low IQ. And so... <laughs> he was frustrated that he didn't get to answer any of the questions. And finally, he raised his hand and said, Miss Ann, Miss Ann. She missed the most important part. Miss Ann looked at him and said, Johnny, what are you talking about? She said, or Johnny said, Miss Ann, if Jesus had seen his shadow, he'd have gone back in for six more weeks and he didn't see his shadow. <laughs> Miss Ann resigned on Monday morning as a Sunday school teacher of the fourth grade boys and girls. Well, listen, this is the most important day of our, our Christian experience because without the resurrection, the Bible says everything in our faith is null and void. Our gathering would not make sense. Our hope would be baseless. But because of what happened on this day nearly 2,000 years ago in a garden tomb when the three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome walked down into that graveyard to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. And they saw that the stone had been rolled away and an angel of the Lord appeared and says, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? This Jesus that you seek is not here. He is risen just as he said. And he's, they, the angel said to them, now go and tell all of his disciples. And boy, they did. Except Mary Magdalene. She remained there in the tomb, overwhelmed by this. And there the resurrected Jesus met her and appeared to her. And then Jesus appeared to the disciples. And that day, he appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. In all, he would appear to more than 500 people after his resurrection. And the Apostle Paul says, if the resurrection did not happen, then nothing in our faith would matter. It would all be in vain. But because Jesus Christ is risen today, our hope is built upon that great fact. Because he lived, you and I can live also. Because he's alive, we can live our life in victory and peace and enjoy by the power of the resurrected Christ. Is anyone thankful this morning that your Savior is alive and well? Well, this morning I want to share with you a message that the Lord has laid on my heart. And I just want to talk to you about because of the resurrection, you and I can experience firsthand uh, this remarkable, remarkable love of God that you and I can personally experience that. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them with me to the most familiar passage in all of the Bible, John three sixteen. It's a message the Lord has laid on my heart and I just want to share with you this morning about the, the wonderful, unconditional love of God. And I'll tell you, like Elizabeth Taylor told her, for eighth, her, her eighth husband, I won't keep you long today, all right? John 3, 16. It's the most recognized verse in all of the Bible. Probably all of us know this passage of Scripture, and it's a wonderful thing that we know it. Here's why. John 3, 16 really is the cliff notes of the entire Bible. It's the spark notes. It summarizes what the story of the Bible is all about about so why not us together this morning let's read it together john three sixteen. say it with me for god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life amen may the lord allow this word to sink deep in our hearts and spirit this morning see this is a picture of the gospel in one sentence 
On one side you have God. On the other side you have man. And right in the middle of this scripture, you have Jesus Christ. 25 words in all. The first 12 are all about God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. That's what God does. God in his beauty and his love and his mercy, he sends us something incredible. The final 12 words of this verse is all about us. That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But right in the middle of this verse, verse, word number 13 is the word son, which is a reference to Jesus. That Jesus Christ came and he bridged the gap between holy, righteous God and sinful man. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, so that we who were far from God and estranged from God might be reconciled to God through and only through Jesus Christ. This is the greatest verse maybe in all of the Bible. And this morning I want to walk you down through four quick phrases so that you and I can truly sink into and experience the unconditional love of God that is validated to us today because of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you have your notes, you're going to want to take a few notes and and follow along as we go this morning. The first thing I want you to know this morning that this Bible teaches us or this verse teaches us is that it begins by, first of all, recognizing God's love for us. We got to stop and we got to recognize God's love for us. Notice what it says. For God, say it with me, so loved the world. The Bible teaches us that God is love. It's his nature. It's his character. Our God is the God of all love. And when God created us, humanity, you, your children, your spouse, your mom and dad, he created us to be the object of his unconditional love. The reason that your heart is beating today, the reason that you're able to draw your next breath is because the love of God has kept you alive so that you may experience and know his love personally. The most wonderful thing about the love of God is that it is unconditional. God does not love you based on how well you perform. God's love love isn't based on who you are or what you have achieved. God's love is based on who he is and what he has achieved for you. And I want you to know this, and I pray that it would just sink down in your heart on this resurrection morning. That God has loved you every moment of your life. Every moment. While you were still in your mother's womb, he loved you. Matter of fact, he loved you so much, the Bible says he wrote a book all about you and he kept it in heaven. When you took your first breath, he saw it and he loved you. When you took your first step, he saw that and he rejoiced. And he loved you. He saw everything about you in your life. He saw the good and he saw the bad. The highs and the lows. The rights and the wrongs. And he has loved you no matter what. Why? Because God is love and he created you so that you would be the object of his great love. Even a thousand years before you were born, God knew on this Easter of 2023, you would be at Grace Fellowship Church. And he knew you would be here just so he could get you still long enough to remind you or maybe tell you for the very first time that God loves you with an unconditional love. For you to hear him say by his Holy Spirit, I love you. And in our workaday world where everything is going at a thousand miles an hour, maybe every now and then we need a moment when God settles our heart and our life. And in a world that's so full of anger, maybe we need just to sit this morning and know that God's unconditional love is towards us. Not based on the fact that we had a good week and not rejected because we had a terrible week but because the nature of our Father in heaven is he is love. Notice what the Bible says there in your notes. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 through 10. God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world 
so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. He sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It's not in your notes, but you may want to jot it down. It's one of the great words of encouragement for our life concerning this unconditional love of God. It says that God demonstrated his love for us that while you and I were still sinners, Christ came to die for us. Before we ever turned to God, before we ever had a a thought of turning our life towards God, God was expressing his love towards us. By sending his own son, Jesus. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. Paul's prayer is this. He says, I'm praying that you may know and you may comprehend how long, how wide, how deep, and how high God's love really is. And that you would experience this love for yourself. The resurrection of Jesus Christ affirms everything Jesus ever said about himself, everything he ever said about the Father, everything he ever said about sin, and everything he said about love and forgiveness. Because Jesus Christ is risen today, you and I can pause and we can recognize God's great love for us. For God so loved the world. The second great truth I want you to know is this. Is if we're going to experience this unconditional love. We must receive God's love. We must receive God's love as the gift it was given to us in. Jesus went on to say for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want you to notice what it doesn't say here. It doesn't say that God sent us a good man. It doesn't say that God sent an angel or that God sent a prophet or that he sent a moral leader or an ethics teacher. No, it says that he sent his son. He cared so very much about us. He sent his very best. God in Christ came to earth to rescue us through the person of Jesus Christ. But we might ask today, why would God send Jesus to us, especially if he was going to die on a cross? Well, that brings us to the real problem of the human experience, doesn't it? It's sin. The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 3 that we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And that's a real problem because the Bible does teach us unequivocally that God is the God of love, but He is also a God who is holy. And His holiness will not allow Him to wink at our sin and our unrighteousness. He can't just sweep it under the rug and say, oh, I'll give you a mulligan on that. For if God did that, he himself would be culpable to sin. He would come into league with sin. Yet God also knew that if he were to punish the sinner at the level that his holiness requires, it would destroy the sinner. That the object of his love, humanity that bears his image, would be destroyed. And God's love would not allow for that, yet God's holiness would not allow for him to wink at our sin. We were in a helpless situation. And there was nothing that you and I could ever do through our own best efforts ever to measure up to God's perfect standard. This is what the Bible says of our condition. Romans chapter 5 verse 6. When we were utterly helpless. Would you say those two words with me? Utterly helpless helpless means there was nothing we could do about our condition it means we were forever stuck no means of effort no righteous activity no amount of money when we were utterly helpless the bible says this christ came at just the right time to die for sinners at just the right time god stepped into the human story in christ jesus so that we who were utterly helpless could be reconciled to him. And then God made this incredible exchange when Christ came. For the Bible says that God then made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that we, in turn, might become right with God Almighty. That Jesus didn't just come so that he would bear our sins, but he would exchange for us something so precious, the righteousness of himself to us. 
That Christ in all of his purity, in Christ in all of his beauty and holiness and love and grace, he would take upon him our sin, our unrighteousness, our rebellion, and he would say to us, and if you'll trust me, I'll give you all of my righteousness. Why in exchange? We were utterly helpless. Christ came and gave us an exchange. Why? So that we could experience the true love of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have now been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Would you say that? Gift of God. Not of works, lest any of us should boast. And that's what John 3, 16 is teaching us. For God so loved the world that he gave us. He gave us this gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. He gave us this gift uh, so that we don't have to carry around our burden and our shame and our guilt any longer. That we can stand righteously before our Father reconciled knowing the one who created us. That we might be the object of his remarkable love. What a story. What grace. And I pray that today we would sit in this wonder of his unconditional love. But here's the third thing we need to see if we're going to really embrace it. Not only must we receive God's gift and recognize God's gift, you and I have to respond to God's gift. You and I have to respond to God's gift in Christ. Notice what it says. Whoever believes in him. Now this is an incredible offer, isn't it? It's an offer of more than just a lifetime. It's the offer of eternity. He says, it's not enough just to know it and to recognize it and just to receive it, understanding it is a gift of God. But you and I now have to respond to it. We have to act on it. And how do we act on it? By getting our act together, by being a better moral citizen, by loving our wives better and our children more. Well, all of those things are wonderful, but that doesn't help us in this story. The only thing that works in this story is for us simply to believe on what God has done for us in Christ Jesus and receive it for ourselves. In the book of Acts, and Paul and Silas, some of you will remember the story when they had been thrown into jail. It sang throughout the midnight hour, the Lord sent an earthquake, opened up the doors of the prison. The jailer who knew he was responsible for Paul and Silas and the other prisoners that he would experience death and be executed for his lack of fulfilling his responsibility as a jailer. He had heard this gospel that Paul and Silas had preached and the jailer asked the question, what must I do to be saved? What must I do? I know death is imminent in my life. I know everything is going in the wrong way. And their answer was not, well, you need to go to church and join down at First Church. Their answer was simply this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. See, that's the difference in Christianity and every other religion in the world. Every other religion says you have to do something. You have to make a pilgrimage to this place. You got to live to this moral standard. But Christianity says something remarkably different. It does not say do. It says done. All the work that needs to be done for you has been done through the cross and the resurrection of our Lord and Jesus Christ. Friends, if you and I would just believe that and receive that, we will be saved. When Jesus was on the cross, he says, it is finished. The work is done. The payment has been made in full. So how are we saved today? We're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. By personally receiving and responding to God. Well, what does this mean to believe? It's kind of an important question, right? Since everything sort of rests now on the fact that we would believe in him. It's something more than just mental ascension, though. See, I I can believe in Hitler, but that doesn't make me a Nazi. I can believe in Stalin, but that doesn't make me a communist. And I can intellectually and historically believe in Jesus, but that doesn't make me a Christian. Believing in the Bible means something much deeper than just intellectual assent. Believing provokes an action in response to what Christ has done in my life. And that action and response are found in two words, repent and follow. 
Repent and follow. See, there's a lot of people today, some three billion people around the world today, they will move into churches and they'll go to services all around the globe. And they'll leave believing intellectually in Jesus Christ. But friends, the Bible says even the demons believe in them. But they refuse to repent and they refuse to follow. And we got to get back to Bible living. Where it means that we turn our life and heart over to the Lord Jesus Christ. And repentance means that we turn from the direction we're going in. And we orient our heart towards the Lord. But it doesn't stop with that. There is a fellowship that takes place. I believe a lot of people have turned their heart and said, oh yeah, I believe in the Lord. I believe he died on the cross. I believe on the third day he rose again. And I believe in him as being the Savior of the world. And they've turned in their thinking concerning Christ. But it's not just our turning. Jesus said over and over, follow me and be my disciples. God give us grace this year as we move into this next season of life that we would not simply repent, but we would follow with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our life, with all of our love, because that's what it means to believe not just to intellectually ascend to that idea but my life now is submitted to you i believe in you i repent towards you and i follow you by the grace you provide someone ought to give the lord praise because it's about a personal relationship trisha and i we've been married 27 years i know her i know her better today than i knew her 27 years ago and it's a good thing that she didn't know me as good back then as she does now. The story could have turned out a little different. But because I live with her and I walk with her and we walk together, we have this union. I know what she likes and I know what she doesn't like. I know what makes her happy and I know what makes her sad. I know what makes her tick and I know what ticks her off. I'm telling you, it's because we're in relationship. And God wants that for us and Him. That God so loved the world, so loved unconditionally, that in this beautiful expression of love, He gave His Son that if we would believe, if we would believe. God, I believe that You're my hope and my Savior. I believe that You're good and I believe that your plans and purposes for me are better than anything I could come in my own life listen to what Titus says for the grace of God has appeared that has appeared that offers salvation to all people you you know who falls in that category of all people you do you fall into that category of all people. See, I'm a whosoever, and you can be a whosoever. Whosoever believes. See, the scripture says it's not God's will that anyone should perish, but all come to the saving knowledge of Christ. You know God's great will for you to begin with? It's that you would know his love, and you would trust his love and his grace and forgiveness. And then here's the last thing this morning. And not only do we recognize God's love and receive God's gift and respond to God's offer, once you do that, you can rest in God's promise. You can rest in the promise of God. Notice what the last phrase says. And you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That you can have everlasting life. This is so important because you and I were made and created to last forever. And one day your heart is going to stop beating. And that will be the end of your body, but that will not be the end of you. God made you in his image and you were made to live forever with him. You're the object of his great love. And he offered his son to redeem you and to bring you back. And in that exchange, he offers you eternal life. That you can rest in. That you can trust in. 
that you don't have to live fearful and anxious over. See, this eternal life that we have isn't something that just begins when we die. It actually begins now in our life. It it means because of what Christ has done for me, I can rest in the fact that my past is resolved. It means that my today can be at peace. And the uncertainty of tomorrow is anchored in eternal hope. I can rest in that. So many people today are anxious and worried and fretting and overwhelmed by circumstances. But friend, if you know this love of God in Christ, you can rest. You can rest in His love, a love that the Apostle Paul says you will never be separated from. When he asked the question, what can ever separate me from the love of God? Life or death or principality or powers or things present or things to come? He says, no, nothing. Nothing will ever separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Therefore, today, whatever I'm going through, I can rest in his promise. I can rest that I have eternal life in him. Notice this final verse of scripture, if you will. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. It is by his great mercy that you and I have been born again. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, we now live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Pure and undefiled. Listen to these words. That you and I have this inheritance. An inheritance that's kept for us in heaven. It's pure, it's undefiled. It's beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Did you hear that? That God himself is giving us an inheritance that can never perish, it will never spoil, it will never fade that is kept for us in heaven and that in our life today he shields us with his power what what a gift what an assurance that I can rest today I can rest in my salvation by his grace I don't have to live fearful am I saved today am I lost tomorrow what if I get it all wrong tomorrow you probably are But your salvation is not based on you getting it right. It's based on the fact he got it right and you're trusting in him. That's salvation by grace. And in all those moments we stumble and we hiccup along the way. Because we have oriented our heart towards him. And we're following him. We continue to move forward in the grace he supplies. Some of you got big issues coming up in your family and uncertainty. But today you can rest in the resurrected Christ and the unconditional love of God. Some of you today, this is your first Easter without a loved one. I've buried some of your family. But because of the resurrection of Christ and their faith in this one, that inheritance that was kept for them, it's also kept for you. And there will be a day when the Lord himself will return. And it will be revealed. The greatest verse in the scripture summarizes it all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but would have everlasting life and as a postscript verse 17 says this and someone needs to hear this today for God did not send his son into the world to condemn this world but that through the son the world might be And because Christ is risen today, this promise is forever settled in heaven. 
because Christ is risen today, I anchor my life in this promise of his love, his forgiveness, his strength, and his grace. Because he is risen today, it doesn't matter what I face today. I have resurrection power now living.